a very good morning and uh, let me at the outset wish you the very best in your efforts to crack the civil services exam the indian administrative service is the dream career of millions of aspirants and therefore i wish you all the very best in your efforts to join the civil service my agenda is as follows i will begin with a brief introduction to the ias i will then describe the format of the exam next i will explore why the csc is considered so tough uh, anshu was telling me before we began that so many of you so many of you are under so much stress so we we'll let's see why you know the reason why this exam is considered so tough and gives so much stress to all the aspirants and i will also provide some as uh, some pointers as to how to crack the exam then i will speak of the post entry training and we will move on to how the ias is not just a job but a way of life and i will offer you some takeaways on how to live that life from my own career experience of the last 33 years so let me begin with a brief introduction to the indian administrative service formed in 1946 the ias is the premier of the three all india services the other two being the indian police service and the indian forest service there are approximately 5000 officers in position though this figure is dynamic it changes from year to year with retirements and new inductions about 2/3 of ias officers are direct recruits the rest are promotees from state cadres ias officers hold office at the pleasure of the president of india the cadre management of the ias is done by the department of personnel and training government of india at the top of the hierarchy of ias officers is the cabinet secretary at the central level the union level and the chief secretary in the state governments followed by the secretary additional secretary joint secretary director deputy secretary and under secretary what is the present format of the civil service exam in india some details of the examination have undergone changes since my time but the broad format remains the same the upsc the union public service commission is the agency which takes care of the entire recruitment process recruitment to 24 services not just the all india services but 24 services including the all india services that is the indian police service and several group a and group b services and central services like the indian foreign service indian audit and account service customs and income tax service are all conducted we have a common examination called the upsc civil services exam or the csc for short this exam is conducted in two two stages stage 1 is the preliminary examination which is held in june every year and the results are announced in august stage 2 is the main examination and this comprises two parts the written examination which is held in october every year and the results are announced in january and the personality test popularly called the interview which is held in march final results are usually announced in may now most candidates take several attempts to crack the exam general category candidates are allowed six attempts obc have nine attempts and scst candidates are allowed unlimited attempts until they reach 37 years of age <coughs> there are several eligibility conditions including age which ranges from 32 upwards depending on category citizenship which includes some other nations along with india and education which is generally an undergraduate degree but includes other qualifications like icai mbbs and so on 
what makes the csc one of the toughest examinations in the world and how can you crack it well the csc is tough to my mind chiefly because of the competition when i wrote the exam in 1987 over a lakh candidates appeared and only about 100 made it to the ias second the examination process itself is very long and excruciating it stretches over a whole year and one sits in the actual examination for about 32 hours from the prelims till the interview and so it requires staying power and stamina third the content can be wide ranging it tests knowledge aptitude and attitude all this makes the csc daunting for an aspirant can you all hear me just say yes 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 ma'am absolutely we can we can so that i have not lost you now how do you prepare for the csc uphill climb though it is it is not an insurmountable civils let me begin with some general tips and then we will move on to specific strategies in my experience what is most important is very simple it is hard work the prelims and mains test your knowledge and analytical skills so regular and diligent preparation is a must maintain regular hours and study every day these are some pointers which i have put up on the screen to help you a well formulated strategy optimum time management familiarity with the optional syllabi thorough insight of the question papers selection of books preparing short notes of important topics with relevant points and revising them just before the examination going through your notes regular regularly and rigorously a good sleep every day never go through any new book or any new topic on the eve of the examination do not lose your confidence at any time and have specific strategies for general knowledge electives and interview for the electives your preparation within the boundaries of the syllabus should be thorough it is not enough to have plus 2 level knowledge an undergraduate level competence may be enough but masters level will be definitely useful especially when you face questions that you did not expect this happened to me one of the questions was what i had skipped but i wrote because of my general understanding of the subject as a whole because i had a masters level understanding for the general knowledge papers you must have more than a passing acquaintance with current affairs international relations and their implications and repercussions over a period of a year so television is not enough and nowadays television is best avoided you should read good newspapers and periodicals at the same time please remember that a civils preparation is not like doctoral research i have done both so i can tell the difference you need not have the kind of in depth knowledge of all the scholarship on the subject as a phd demands what an intelligent informed citizen knows and understands that is your study plan the third stage is the interview officially it is called a personality test and the objective of the interview is to assess the personal suitability of the candidate for a career in public service by a board of competent and unbiased observers the test is intended to evaluate the mental caliber of the candidate in broad terms this is an assessment not only of a candidate's intellectual qualities but also social traits and interest in current affairs some of the qualities to be judged are mental alertness 
critical powers of assimilation, clear and logical exposition, balance of judgment, variety and depth of interest, ability for social cohesion and leadership, and intellectual and moral integrity. Now, the technique of the interview is not of a cross-examination. It is not a courtroom. You are not facing a jury or a hostile advocate. It is of a natural but directed and purposeful conversation that is intended to reveal your mental qualities. The interview is not intended to test either the specialized or the general knowledge of the candidate, which has already been tested through the written papers. Candidates are expected to have taken an intelligent interest, not only in their subjects of special study, their electives, and also their academic study, but also in the events that are happening around them, both within and outside their own state and country, as well as modern currents of thought and new discoveries, which should rouse the curiosity of all well-educated youth. The interview standards are very high and require thorough preparation as well as commitment. So in preparation for the interview, don't just read, but also spend time thinking about what you read. To summarize, the interview guidelines are as follows. The interview tests you for your ideas and your opinions. Speak your mind and express your views fearlessly. Practice in mock discussion groups and participate in them actively. Thorough knowledge of your subjects helps. If you are working, thorough knowledge of your profession helps too. Knowledge and opinions about your stated hobbies is important. So don't claim something which you don't understand. Prepare for situational questions, how you will solve a problem, problem situation. And don't be hyper or interrupt. This is a common mistake. Don't do that. So let's now pass on to the next stage. You cross the prelims, cross the mains, come through the interview, and you have entered the service. What happens next? Once you are in, the training begins. The Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, LBSNAA for short, in Masuri, is India's premier institution dedicated to training officers of the country's higher civil services. LBSNAA conducts induction level training to members of the All India Services and Sir Central Services Group A through a common foundation course. So it's a big mela. All of us gather together in Masuri at the time for the foundation course. Once the FC is over, LBS NAA conducts induction level and post entry professional training for officers of the Indian Administrative Service programs which includes one year in the academy and one year district training. Subsequently, the LBS NAA also conducts mid-career training for the IAS. Now, this question arises, what happens to the other services after the foundation course? Each service goes to its re respective academy. The police go to Hyderabad. Uh, the foreign service goes to Delhi. So you have several, uh, many such institutions. Uh, specialized for that particular service, and they all move to their specialized training. Now, today you are grappling with the question, to be or not to be a civil servant. Will I clear the CSC or will I not? But a few years from today, you would have entered the prestigious pantheon of the IAS. <coughs> what does becoming an IAS officer and being an IAS officer in pain. A service officer performs a variety of functions. She handles affairs of government, both the framing and the implementation of policy. Implementation of policies calls for supervision and also traveling 
to places of implementation. It also entails disbursement of funds, which calls for personal supervision. There's a high level of financial accountability. IAS officers are answerable to the parliament and the state legislatures. What is significant, and this is important, an officer's functions and responsibilities change at different points in her career. At the beginning of her career, she joins the state administration at the subdivisional level as a subdivisional magistrate, subdivisional officer, assistant commissioner, assistant collector. It is variously called, has different names in different states. And there, as assistant commissioner or subdivisional magistrate, she looks after law and order, general administration, and development work. At the district level, IAS officers work as district magistrates or district collectors or deputy commissioners. And this is a prestigious and visible post with responsibility for district affairs, including implementation of law and order, magistracy, and developmental programs. Officers also serve in the state secretariat as heads of departments or in public service undertakings. IAS officers may move from positions at the state under deputation to the center and then back again. At both the central and the state governments, their work involves formulation and implementation of policy. Policy formulation and decision making is done at, by officers at various levels, like the deputy secretary, the joint secretary, who all make their contributions. The final shape to the policy or a final decision is taken with the concurrence of the minister by the secretary or the cabinet, depending upon the gravity of the issue. Being in the IAS, the job is stressful but satisfying. There is a lot of variety in public interface and public contact. The problems are overwhelming, but solutions are possible. You will witness corruption, nepotism, might is right, but you can uphold the rule of law. What keeps you going, and this is true of me and many others as well, is the love and affection of the people at large who you meet day to day and interact with on a daily basis. From the moment you are in, the question arises, <coughs> what so sort of civil servant should I be? And this is a question you will grapple with for the rest of your career. You will hear a lot about integrity, fearlessness, incorruptibility, neutrality, and so on. You will also watch bemused as those who extol those high ideals for you fail to practice them when fail to practice it themselves so they don't practice what they preach so i will speak to you from the corner of pragmatism we civil servants are practitioners doers not philosophers or ideators so pragmatism is right up our alley Having said that, let me gather up some random pragmatic pearls of wisdom to share with you. First, learn to deal with expectations, both your own expectations and the expectations of those around you. Again and again, you will find yourself in situations where you have had very little preparation, advice, or support. But you need to deal with the situation then and there, and you need to solve the problem. Everyone within and outside the system will be looking up to you for guidance. There will be others who will be just waiting for you to make a mistake. Many years ago, I was posted as deputy commissioner of the new district of Udupi. 
At that time, my chief secretary Riley observed, wherever you stand, that is the district. He was sadly prescient. The entire population of the district, politicians, public, the intelligentsia that Udupi is known for, expected that the deputy commissioner would wave a magic wand and the new district will magically manifest. Unfortunately, that is not the speed with which the wheels of the government turn. There were no precedents. I had to forge my own path and it took time, patience and effort, a lot of goodwill and a lot of persuasion. But it was done. It proved to be one of the most fulfill fulfilling postings of my career. Second, nothing substitutes for presence. This pithy maxim encapsulates a number of things, so let us dissect it. Shortly after you join your new post, your office will try to house train you. Don't let it do so. Bring the value of your newness, your fresh perspective to your work, that is, your particular value add. See for yourself, read for yourself, listen to advice, but decide for yourself. The best way to do this is through field work. In the age of technology, it is very easy to create an illusion of awareness by data collection and data display in the confines of your office. You will also find many officers send you complex computer pyrotechnics, all color coded and diagrammatic. But when you visit the field, that is a whole different reality. The IAS is one job that gives you the luxury of exploring every nook and corner of your jurisdiction in reasonable comfort. I know many academics who long to have these opportunities. They cannot because they don't have a Gram Sahayak to show the way or a Tasildar who will see that they are well fed. But you do. So, Roam your own piece of earth and you will learn to love the people whom you have come to serve and you will enhance your own efficiency while doing so. My third point is somewhat contrary to what I said before. I would like you to use technology as much as possible for public service delivery. You are uniquely fortunate in entering the service at the cusp of the old and the new India. So you can use the advantages of both. Karnataka has pioneered many technological innovations in public service like Bhumi, Mobile One, eMundi, eProcurement, to name just a few. I'm sure you will be able to find ways to customize these innovations to your workspace but also come up with new innovations designed by you. Above all, if you succeed in routinizing technology, making it an ordinary quotidian part of your and your office's daily functions, that will be your greatest contribution. You may enter public service at a time when the system, as well as the environment around you, will become highly or already has become highly politicized. The levels of scrutiny of your professional and personal conduct by the media, the courts, various formal and non-formal watchdog agencies are as never before. In such a milieu, the importance of ethics is doubly important. I spoke of expectations. Keep your own expectations low. I spoke of idealism versus pragmatism. Today, good conduct and ethics are not just a function of idealism. They are a pragmatic necessity. Keep yourself clean. Keep your conduct above board. You will be able to take tough decisions. You may not be able to please everyone, but you need not be shy of being firm. But when you act tough, act right, be well prepared. 
proper justification and documentation will protect you. Try to be kind. Everyone around you is facing her or his own struggles. So even when you speak truth to power and to the powerless, be gentle. As my senior said to me so many years ago, Satyam Bruyat, Priyam Bruyat, Na Bruyat Satyam Apriyam, Priyam Cha Nandrutam Bruyat, Isha Dharma Ha Sanatanaha. Speak truth in such a way that it should be pleasing to others. Never speak truth which is unpleasant to others. Never speak untruth which may be pleasant. This is the path of eternal morality, Sanatana Dharma. Thank you all and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a doubt, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, after making any policy, how government will implement from roots onwards, in the sense from rural areas onwards, okay. any opposition leader uh, conflict will happen in that in that uh, area, what you will do, ma'am? Okay. See, when a policy is first formulated, it goes through a very long process. Most policies are not just, you know, done blindly. Uh, we go through... Uh, a draft policy is prepared and we go through a process of taking feedback. You would have noticed if you look at Government of India web websites in particular, they even put it up for receiving public feedback. So mm -hmm. we too, for example, in my office, we formulated the sports policy. Now mm -hmm. we are formulating a policy for the use of public sports facilities. We have stadia, we have, uh, you know, so many other gyms, public gyms, which we run. So for the use of those, we are formulating a policy. What we do is we make a draft policy, which itself passes through several levels. It first mm -hmm. is formulated by the cutting edge level is the head of department. Then it comes to the secretary, which is my level. Okay. And before it is you know, formulated or finalized, it is published. And we receive public aid. In fact, that uh, one month time is given to the public to give their own reactions, their objections, and their feedback, if any. Then we go through the process of examining that. And then, it, again, we change the policy depending on the feedback. Then it moves up to the cabinet. So at a state or central level, it passes through many levels, as well as a process of taking public as well as official feedback before it is formulated. This is the first stage. When it actually goes out for implementation, then the responsibility is to the respective officers. For example, in my department, we take sports. Then the responsibility is that of the CEO of the Zilla Panchayat and the assistant director sports who is at the district level. They too may find that some things may work or may not work. So then they send their feedback. There is always the freedom to contact, come back to your secretary or come back to your head of, head of department saying this particular aspect does not work. For example, okay. we had a Dasara, we hold Dasara sport every year, right? It's a special mm -hmm. event. Now, one particular year, they decided to hold the Dasara sports at the state level only without going through a many tired level. Now, the public came back to us and said, no, this is not the way we want that from village level selection is done so that everybody can participate. So the next year, we again modified and we started holding a multi-tiered Dasara sports and that was a great success. So there are, you know, it's an iterative thing. There's nothing rigid and fixed in stone. Remember, all this is policy. It is not law. Acts and rules are different things. Policies are implementable. And that is the most important thing. So that is how we go about it. I, I hope that verified the question. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Thank, ma yeah. thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, yeah. so we open the floor for students to ask uh, their queries with madam. Are you able to see uh, me? Because I can't see myself. Yes. So there's some yes, little glitch here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. As we have said, thank you very much for this excellent. My pleasure. My really, pleasure. We really, I mean, got enriched with the right from the inception till how it functions. 
you really covered it absolutely brilliantly i would say thank you so much it was a pleasure interacting with you thank and, you uh, getting in and like my question is i mean you did cover a bit of it about uh, the age limit and the number of attempts and everything uh i'm going to be for myself i'm an ex defense officer uh, a lieutenant commander in the indian navy i've been trained and a short service commission officer so uh you said 37 years of age uh, for the ias is that is there a relaxation for the same i was asking anshu ma'am the same and uh, so we were just about finding out so i retired last year and now i had an mnc and uh, look after their us operations as well but Uh, like you said, the, the pleasure of uh, doing something for our own people is entirely different. And after that, we uniform for ten long years. I would actually like to come back and do uh, better uh, and uh, try and get into the administrative services as well. So, would you be aware, ma'am? I know it's an off the. Yeah, I I have to I have to check. We do have officers uh -huh. from uh, the defence services coming to us. but i am uh, the point about age relaxation i am not sure maybe anshu may be able to answer that query perhaps anshu is there a age relaxation for uh, short service commission officers i you have muted your mic yeah so there is an age relaxation in uh, state civil services and we have to check actually his queries so excuse me ma'am there is five yeah, years age relaxation Five, five years, five years age relaxation to okay. defence uh, retired personnel. Right. So that answers Thank your you question. You. But uh, you. yeah. let me also add: uh, is that Sujit Hiramat? Is that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sujit. Yeah. Sujit. Uh, yes. See, the, uh, things are very different from my time when you know options were limited, and if you want, uh, if you had an interest in public service. Uh, government was the only option available to you it was broadly you know the ias or medicine or engineering and engineer medicine you practice and engineering you enter a company or corporate sector and uh, ias you enter public service today that those you know the silos are disappearing uh, some you may find that uh, you know in your private capacity you may be able to exercise your social responsibility much more effectively then uh, you know we can with uh, within the constraints which uh, government service imposes upon you so uh, you know since i think you already had two careers uh, think yes, carefully yeah uh, you're welcome to enter the public service but public service is not confined to the civil services anymore uh, the ngo sector is available mm -hmm. there's yes, a lot which you can do as an individual so i would you know i i would feel that uh, you know we should stop thinking that uh, social responsibility is prerogative or uh, the responsibility of government alone it's it's everyone's burden to uh -huh. so all of us have to do Correct, it yeah yeah i would absolutely agree with you on that yeah <laughs> but the the kind of authority that you uh, i mean like you said right the iterative right from the formulative process and then it goes to iterative process and then we can implement and do good uh, uh, greater good for everybody certainly what, certainly uh, really excite and uh, yeah yeah certainly the i is so, gives you a long yeah. uh, lot of scope uh, and uh, uh, it's a very so structured much. way yeah. but do all of you i mean this applies to all of you please don't think that social responsibility is the burden of uh, public servants alone all of us are public servants and it's high time that we realize that uh, as citizens we can and should do much more than we do yeah thank you so much sujeet and thank you so much ma'am for uh, answering his queries so do we have any other questions we'll take one or two more questions and then we'll wind up good morning ma'am Uh, i have a question that how to stay motivated throughout the preparation especially when we are working now ma'am it, it feels quite <laughs> it's a common question i know mean, yeah, so uh, no I, it has to come from within okay uh, it's uh, you should have that uh, it's not even a question of motivation it is just a question of staying the course see uh, so hard work discipline and diligence is actually much more relevant than uh, you say staying motivated motivation will come and go 
So it's uh, just do your regular hours every day that you know you earmark this many hours. I used to, I did a lot of preparation, but I, I wasn't working when I started preparing for the exam. But I had joined as a doctoral scholar in IIT Madras at that time. So I was kind of, you know, doing my uh, PhD studies and doing my uh, IAS preparation at the same time. Well, subsequently, I had to leave IIT because when I joined the IAS, I had to move out. Uh, and I completed my doctorate much later from IIM Bangalore. Uh, the, uh, the thing is that uh, it's not a question. It just earmark those regular hours and uh, stick to them every day, and prepare those notes so that you know you need not go through. Uh, Anshu was uh, commenting how that very vastness of uh, the syllabus itself, literally anything under the sun, or literally anything that the uh, subject can cover can come in your question paper. So you need two things: that you need a broad understanding of your subject. And you need those specific topics where you are well versed enough, you know enough to write a good answer. You simply don't need to go into every item of scholarship as you have to do for a PhD. This is a mistake, common mistake, which uh, many uh, aspirants for the IAS or the civil services do, that you think it is akin to doctoral research. Since I've done doctoral research, it's a very different kind of study which is required. Here you need to be able to know the basics and think about it and write intelligently and stick to regular hours get a good sleep don't bother about motivation motivation and uh, these things will come and go you just have to stick to it and if so motivation is a problem today when you are preparing then when you come into the service it will be you know uh, hell, <laughs> hell to pay yeah. True, man. True, because man. every day is a challenge and there are so many days of struggle and frustration it's never an easy job. It's a stressful job. So <laughs> Thank just you, take motivation for granted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidashri, for asking this question. And thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, answering her queries. And uh, do we have any other questions? I would like to ask one question, ma'am. So uh, basically, we get a lot of students and uh, uh, most of them they come after engineering or after their graduation so i asked them before taking their admission that why do you want to become ias okay they are not able to reply and the same question they ask in the interview board as well that why you want to become ias after doing engineering or mbbs or ca so uh, what do you think that uh, what should be the student's answer or what should be the student's perception to enter into IAS so that they can do justice because these are public services. And again, as you told that it is a very stressful job as well. So uh, what should be the answer or the perception? You should, in your own mind, you should be clear as to why you want to enter the service. And it's better to be honest about it. Uh, if we only speak of high ideals of public service, uh, you may be true, or you may be truthful and right, but the, uh, the interview panel may not completely accept it. There is an element that um, the IAS uh, gives you prestige in society. It opens so many doors. Uh, it gives you a wide variety of experience, which probably no other, no other profession or job can give. So while your public service is an important goal, there's no harm in uh, mentioning uh, the prestige associated with the service, the variety of experience and the cross-sectoral experience which uh, the IAS gives. But this is true of the IAS and a little bit of uh, it's true of the IPS, but not so much of the other central services because they are more specialized. And the level of public interaction which uh, the civil services give, all civil services and particularly the IAS gives, that is unmatched. It's unparalleled in any other job. You can also say that you want to bring in engineers and doctors, you have a specialized expertise. It would be good to say that that specialized expertise, you would like to put it at the service of the public at large, instead of you know merely a limited clientele, which you will otherwise cater to. So these are some of the things which top of the head I can uh, tell you. Uh, 
but be honest about it there's no harm in admitting that the prestige is attracts you it's not the money because there's very little of that so uh, the what the respect which you get in society the recognition which you get uh, that is and the prestige associated with the service these are also good motivators acceptable motivators okay thank you so much ma'am for answer so do we have any other questions hi uh, adarsh adarsh you know what is a mm, what is the best is about the preparation of pps after graduation or after 12th ha huh. Yeah, the level of competition is so high. I can't say. Yeah, uh, you need to have a basic undergraduate degree. You can start preparing any time. I started preparing, frankly speaking, only after I completed my post graduation. That is my MA. I completed my MA, got into IIT Madras, started doing a PhD. Found that they did not have a guide who could uh, guide me in my particular subject. because it was a technological institute and my interest was in humanities and social sciences then i started preparing but when i did prepare it was very intensive i used to work very hard so uh, it is good enough if you start after your uh, in the final year of your undergrad i i would say it is good enough but um, again it's after all a competitive exam it all depends on how your other how the other competitors do so uh, really the sky is the limit because there is no fixed syllabus and uh, you know literally it can be anything you will be questioned mostly on that year of preparation year especially during the personality test they will ask you about things which happened in the last 6 to 9 months or so so you should be very well versed regarding that last year of undergrad should be enough in my estimation given my uh, with my experience people may do more or less they really do thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am for answering his queries so as we are running short of time um, again if there is any question we'll ask one more question and then we'll wind up Shravanti, do you want to ask any question? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, it's something related to women, ma'am. Completely. Uh, you got selected in 1987, correct, ma'am? Yeah. Those days, uh, people it said they won't encourage uh, women to go to school. Women to uh, and they won't encourage to higher studies. How your parents encouraged you? How you motivated yourself? Those days, we don't have that much technology to uh, go further, ma'am. So how have you motivated yourself, ma'am? Those days. See, the thing is, uh, we have to go a little. Shravanti, we have to go a little uh, uh, more into the past than that. There was no real uh, obstruction or objection within the family for entering the IAS. The real trouble had come earlier uh, than that, and. Uh, uh, i have narrated this in the past i complete i completed my post uh, my uh, undergraduation in 1983 and uh, my family always encouraged education right it is a uh, uh, it's a family where it was very important that uh, you know we are all well educated and uh, so i had grown up with this uh, understanding that i would do uh, an ma a masters that was very much on the card i taken it for granted Uh, but uh, what happened when i was doing my ba final exams uh, i was actually preparing for my finals at that time and uh, my one of my uncles he had uh, he wanted to get me married he suddenly uh, got this idea that no i should we should get a he, he took upon himself the responsibility of getting me married and uh, much as my parents had prized education we had another uh, the custom or practice in the family which is deference to elders and this was the eldest uncle my father's eldest brother so they immediately deferred like there was no rebuttal from my parents so when he said get, uh, get her married and he started making uh, preparations for that 
there was no real objection from their side and i was horrified i was aghast because i had never imagined that you know there would be a possibility that i would not do my ma and mm-hmm. i remember that i used to be preparing for my ba finals at that time and i had generally i was uh, i got on well with my parents and i was a obedient child so to say but uh, this time i really put my foot down and i used to come running out of my room in the middle of my final preparation and i used to i want to do my ma i must do my ma i must do my ma and uh, my horizons were you know so it is short neck syndrome no that was the extent of my horizon that i needed to do a masters i could not imagine a life without doing a masters degree and uh, fortunately my my insistence prevailed over my uncles and my parents gave gave in and uh, i did complete my ma and then i got into iit madras and uh, i got into is there was no murmur from the family at that time my yeah. uncle had completely given up his efforts and then i did one more masters and then a third masters and uh, then i did my phd and i did get married as well so so we satisfied that part of the deal yeah uh, that's what happened so it does happen in uh, everyone's life that there will be you know sometimes uh, some cha- incident where you'll have to put your foot down uh, mm-hmm. so getting into the ias for me was you know not so much it was more a matter of chance that okay. uh, when i found that iit madras did not have a guide who could guide me in my particular area uh okay. i just did take that bold decision of moving out of iit which is a very difficult decision to take and i had stood all india first in that uh, research admission examination called yeah. sira common examination for research admission i did take the decision of stepping out and getting into the ias so it happens but you know in your mind and your heart where you have to take a stand yeah yeah ma'am correct thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am again you are very good you are very good in academics and uh, it's really good to see you are an inspiration for all the girls of india who had take the stand in boys <laughs> boys also yeah. i mean in oh, 1997 yeah, i understand it would have been really very difficult even now it is difficult for uh, women but that time again it was very much difficult so uh, yeah shravanti is also married she is having kid with that she is also married she is having own i can see the little baby there on her profile photograph yeah yes ma'am <laughs> yeah so thank you so much ma'am for your pearls of wisdom and as a small token of gratitude i uh, would like to give you this book that is ethical dilemmas of a civil servant it is written by Anil yeah. sir, thank uh, you so much. Secretary of uh, Government of India. He is retired, 1981 batch IAS officer. And uh, as a small token of appreciation, this uh, uh, it's an antique piece, which thank is very so nice. yeah. kind. Thank you so much. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, very we'll uh, we'll be sending you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and please come on the camera, all of you, so that we can have a photograph. Yeah, I was missing uh, seeing Joker and Rosemary and Samra to show. Okay, we'll take a photograph with Madam. So, Ma'am, when the lockdown is over, please come to the institute and interact sure. with us. Yeah, happy to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ma'am. Wish you all the very best, and let me know when you clear the civils. Sure, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. All the best. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your pearls of wisdom, and uh, I wish you all the best. May you reach more heights in your career, and uh, our students should also do good in their examination. Thank you. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.
Thank you all very much. All the very best. Thank you. Thanks for the gentleman.